and i picked readings that i thought would be first of all readable and interesting and gripping. and i will talk about two that i regard as ah three actually that i will recommend and i'll come back to that three that i think are both extremely well written and are designed for unitarians at least in my from what i know about them actually the last two talks were both to unitarian congregations one in bloomington indiana and the other out in the suburbs of chicago so i am going to talk about the bible bible history in the context of what i'm calling a contextual revolution so i want to clarify what i mean by that here's a photograph i took out the window of snow on trees it's set in a background that's completely different just a blue background let's go on to the next slide and here i placed the same photograph into a context that looks just like it and you can tell that the photograph is at least if you were to compare them you could pick out one of the borders but some of them merge so when you place things into a different context it changes what you're seeing and we all have examples of that so what the purpose of this talk is to say that we have undergone in the last 500 years a contextual revolution that affects how we see the bible how we regardless of who we are even fundamentalists how we see the bible in one way or another and that's what i would like to uh communicate so let's go on let me say a bit more about that before the contextual revolution now notice the date 1848 and notice cambridge university so you may be exact you may think i'm exaggerating when i say in the next slide that uh the transformation in a sense took place in the late 19th century a lot of the revolution took place going all the way back to columbus discovering that there were more continents than just three but this this was perfect for my purposes that cambridge university as late as 1858 had a official question that you were expected to know the answer to on their whatever their tripos exams mean but they are pretty important and the answer came out of you know the usher chronology of the bible the 6 000 year young creationist view of when the world came into existence so that's 1848 okay let's go on here's another way of representing how the world looked how the cosmos looked before the bible this is one of my favorite images it's a enormous um map medieval map actually i think if you hit it one more time there's a little bit more about it it's five by four feet uh in size it's on parchment beautiful leather goes back to around 1300 and my wife and i were in england and had a chance to see this it's in a library in the basement of hereford cathedral and the library has books chained to the shelves this is an old library and these these amazing maps there are many of them all across europe uh are not only geography their history in effect they're the entire cosmos and they're incredible detail jerusalem's in the center this is the uh, mediterranean i think it's black and so on so three continent world and um this is what it looked like let's go on uh from the biblical world to the big bang it's a different cosmos and um human history goes back at least 200,000 years ago now um somebody was oh arthur was telling me about some of you seeing a series uh, maybe it's a teaching company series on religion and going back to neolithic and paleolithic um, evidences of of, of that, that there was some sense of something beyond just utilitarian uses so we don't know how far back humans go but it certainly goes back earlier than 600,000 years I don't to go ahead part of this uh contextual revolution is the history of the earth itself and earth history the earth itself according to the physicists and geologists 
goes back to at least 4.5 billion years to one. And of course, the Big Bang, the universe, they tell us, goes back to 14 billion. Well, that's a pretty different time scale. It's cosmic. Go ahead. And these are affecting how we see ourselves. We all know this in one way or another. So part of this revolution is not just out there, it's sort of going on inside us. Um, go ahead. Could you please explain an example of this last? Sure. Um, well, uh, I, I know all of you could actually give me an example of how these are affecting us. One way it's affecting me is the that uh, I find, after 70 years or so living in a Bible world, or at least exposed to a Bible world, and you know, one of the common ways of thinking about religion is in terms of mystery. I find personally far more mystery reading what the physicists are finding, what the neuroscientists are finding when they go into the brain. So science seems to me to be unfolding far more wonder at the world we're living in. That's one reason. I think other people are getting, are, 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 it, it, it's disoriented, right? So it, it's affecting us all in very different ways. And if I were to sit here and uh, ask you for examples, I think you would come up with it. But obviously, one way it's affecting uh, people who hold to the Bible in one way or another is in many ways. Some feel that this whole thing is threatening their view of what they hold here, their, their view of God. That's the most obvious, right? Creationists, evolution, and all the rest of it. So, uh, it's affecting, I think, all of us in one way or another about how we understand ourselves. Uh, so we can come back to that if, if, if you'd like to. Um, so it's not only this outside revolution and inside revolution, but now let's get down a little bit closer to the biblical history itself. There has been an incredible revolution in evidence, material evidence, in the last 200 years. Um, and to pick a date, on December 3rd, 1872, this is only 20 or more years after that Cambridge exam question, the English world was electrified by the announcement, not, I should have said European, by the announcement that a non-biblical flood story had been discovered. Let's go ahead. What happened on that day? According to one ancient Near Eastern historian writing fairly recently, the Bible lost its immemorial prerogative of being the oldest book known, a book that was absolutely unique, dictated by God himself. Now, obviously, that's a bit of an exaggeration, but what he's saying is that that's one dramatic moment. That announcement, and it really was. It, 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 the, go ahead, and I'll say a little bit more about that. Um, as a result of the discoveries represented by that flood story, uh, archaeologists in the last 200 years have uncovered over half a million tablets, clay tablets, ri written inscriptions from the ancient Near Eastern world, from the world surrounding <coughs> biblical history. Um, so I don't know whether you know about clay tablets in cuneiform, but this is the these are the, uh, this is the script and this is the uh, material that they wrote on for, from at least 4,000 BC down to the last cuneiform tablets uh, that they found go all the way up to the first century AD or second century AD. There are still some clay tablets being written in, in Babylon that date, that date as late as that. So this is the entire suite. And um, not only these, uh, Mesopotamian writings, but it wasn't until the 19th century that the Egyptian hieroglyphics, the monuments that had been exposed to the surface all this time, could be read. They were not be, uh, in decrypted until after the discovery of the Rosetta Stone, 1799, and then it took them another 20 or 30 years to be able to uh, figure out to use that, actually translate the hieroglyphics. So really it wasn't until the middle of the 19th century and on that the Egyptian evidence could be read. Well, there's a lot of, there are a lot of stories. In fact, the great stories in the Bible are all about 
the Israelites in Egypt. The Exodus from Egypt, 400 years of slavery in Egypt. Uh, let's escape from Egypt and go to Palestine. Well, it turns out that during the time that that was supposed to have taken place, Palestine was firmly in the control of Egypt. So fleeing to Palestine was not really an option to get away from Egypt. And there's no ifs, ands, or buts. That's not speculation. That's based on solid evidence. And then there's the Dead Sea Scrolls that were discovered in 1848 that will, um, I'll come back to. Then there's the great, or I shouldn't, shouldn't say great, but the Da Vinci Code Gnostic texts, right, that were discovered in the 1840s. So the evidence is accumulating. Let's go ahead. Um, so it's affecting the world context of biblical history. Go ahead. Um, so here's the question of this uh, morning. How to talk about the Bible after the revolution? Um, and again, I want to concentrate or, or clarify that what I'm after is how to bring the Bible back down into human history, how to bring it back down to earth. That's what I would like to be able to do for myself, and I'd like to suggest one way to get at it are some guidelines for how to get at that if that's interests you. How do we fit this particular set of writings and tradition and so on into the rest of human history, into this large context of human history? How does it fit? And the, 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 the direction of scholarship up until, I would say, the 20th century has been to keep it apart. It's different. It's unique. It's separate. Somehow or other, it's separate. I read a 500-page uh, history of New Testament scholarship way back. And every single chapter of every single scholar, no matter how far off they went to this, the spectrum of, the, of, 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 of orthodoxy, found something unique. Well, there's something unique about every history and every tradition, but not absolutely unique. So this effort to protect it is what I'm trying to fight against. I want to see how it fits. Let's go ahead. And I gave this handout because if there's, if there's one thing that people know little about, who know a lot about the Bible, it's Judaism, specifically Second Temple Judaism. How many of you have heard of Second Temple Judaism? One, two, three, there's a handful. Two weeks ago. <laughs> so here's the view of biblical history uh, before the revolution, the textual revolution. So we know all about, we know, those of us who grew up, know all about the Old Testament. We memorized the 39, quote, books of the Old Testament. We memorized the 29 books of the New Testament. Uh, and we know about Israel and the Jews, Exodus and all the rest of it. We know about the creation of the world. And then we know about Jesus, for sure. But this was 586 BC. This is the first century AD. There's 600, six centuries between these two stories. And basically, for most of it, that was just a big question mark, skip over. Or worse, that was Judaism. And what we knew about the Jews was that they were legalistic. They had lost the spirit. They were dead. There was nothing creative, nothing inventive. It was uh, not worth studying. Well, what I'm here to tell you this morning is that that is the link, the linchpin, that holds the whole story together. And that's what I would like to at least suggest to you and uh, give you some reasons for thinking that. And. Uh, this Judaism is distinguished from what we know today, rabbinic Judaism. These are broad terms. Language here is incredibly tricky and dangerous, and I'm going to say a few words about some words. And in the handout, I say something about the word the Bible. I'm going to use the word the Bible uh, as if we all know what we mean. But in fact, there is no such thing as the Bible. There are lots of Bibles, lots of Christian Bibles, lots of Jewish Bibles, lots of other Bibles that share the same set of writings and so on. So just let me um, use some of these terms. I prefer now early Judaism, but I did, decided not to confuse matters because there's more than one temple during this period. And there was more than one temple before this period. So this is part of the what I'm going to call later the mythology. So yeah. you say there's more than one temple. Yeah. 
There were two in Egypt, Jewish temples. During this period, the struggle with is how, um, what the, like how we stood for what? Well, they were, these were the ones that I'm referring to were Jewish temples. They were temples to presumably the Jewish God. There's not a lot known about them, but they, we know that they were Jewish temples, and in fact, they were. When they, when they built the temple in, in, in uh, Egypt, they asked permission from the uh, high priests in Jerusalem. Right? Physical building? Physical building. Oh, yes. Excellent. Yeah. Now, I'll, I'll, I will say a little bit more. In fact, I'll show you one of those buildings. Yeah, we're talking about a physical structure. And is, is it fair to say that, you know, that the point is that there weren't there weren't churches in every town? So, I mean, these were... No, no, no. no. This is, this is these were sort of the places you would go to. Yes, and in fact, the reason... This period is known as Second Temple Judaism, which doesn't take account of the others, is because, again, what I'm going to call the mythology, the, the myth, of the, the, the monomyth, just to throw that term in, anyway, is that there was only one temple. Okay, one God, one temple, one people, and so on. So the idea that this is the Second Temple means, well, the first temple was destroyed, now we've got the Second Temple. That got destroyed in 70 AD. The, the, the Second Temple Judaism is defined by these two dates. 586, when the first temple was destroyed, the first Jerusalem temple, Solomon's temple. And in 70 AD, the Second Temple was destroyed. So it's a nice, clean boundary. Yes? Can you put into uh, perspective who were the peoples in this part of the world at this time and who was it who was destroying the temple? Yeah. Um, okay. Prior to 586, the empires, surrounding empires were the Egyptians, the uh, Sumerians going all the way back, Assyrians, Babylonians in, in the Tigris Euphrates River, just one after the other. It was the Babylonians who destroyed the temple. Uh, in Jerusalem, the Assyrians had destroyed the northern kingdom back in the 722, and the temple that was destroyed, I mean, the, the destroyers of the temple in 70 AD. Does anybody know? The Romans. The Romans, right. They were, so after the Babylonians, the Persians took over. The Persians actually had the largest empire to that point in the Near East. The Persians were defeated by... Anybody? Who? Alexander the Great came along and defeated not only the Greeks, but the Persians, destroyed the Persian Empire. And so the Greek uh, successors of Alexander uh, <coughs> occupied the entire Near East and uh, the Eastern Mediterranean down to 322 or so, and then, uh, I'm sorry, down to the Greeks, down to uh, around. Uh, 60 AD, that's a, that's a useful date, when the Romans, when Pompey entered the Jerusalem temple. In other words, the Rome took over Palestine in 60 AD. So we've got um, Babylonians, Persians, Greeks, Romans. It's, it's one empire after another. What really matters at this point is that for 600 years, Judaism was a tiny little province of large empires. It was no longer a kingdom, which was uh, what Israel had been before. The kings of David and Solomon and so on had been destroyed. Uh, and what they had was a temple. It was a cult state. The high priests ran the state. And they ran it under <coughs> authorities, the Persians, the Greeks, and the Romans. There was a short time. Had, Hasmoneans, the Maccabees, you may have heard about them. They're about the only thing anybody knows about Second Temple Judaism. The Jews certainly know about the Maccabees because that was the one short period when uh, a Jewish kingdom was reestablished. But it was reestablished right from the beginning under other larger, wider authorities. They were never totally independent. Uh, so Second Temple Judaism is a provincial part of large empires. In terms of the geopolitical, whatever, politics, that's what matters. Let's go ahead, unless there's another. Again, please don't hesitate to stop me. OK, Second Temple Judaism, I'm going to suggest, is the key to understanding biblical history as history. 
Let's go ahead and see why. First of all, because that was the society, the scribes, the writers, the intellectuals, who invented our picture, those of us who grew up in the Bible, of Israel. The history of Israel was invented as a monotheistic state from the beginning. One God created the heavens and the earth, called Abraham out, called the people out, and from the beginning they were monotheistic. If there was some polytheism involved, it was because they had fallen aside. And then they went back to their monotheism. That's a myth. Okay. The second invention, they invented a world religion. They invented the rabbinic Judaism of today by, in fact, inventing the history of their traditions as monotheistic. And third, they invented Christianity. And I want to say more about that at the end. I'm hoping I get time at the end to try to say what I mean by that. We know Jesus was a Jew. But Christianity from the start has done everything it could to divide Jesus from Judaism. He was different. He was creative. Judaism was dead. He was filled with the spirit. They had become scholastic, legalistic priests. He was filled with charismatic uh, power. They were following the law. They were ritual. They were Catholics. <laughs> so, uh, so Christianity uh, was in fact an outgrowth of that dead Judaism. Let's go ahead. Bruce, uh, yes. yeah, yeah, one right. comment, and I'm thinking of uh, projecting into other sessions we might have in this area. All of us Unitarians, of course, uh, descended from the Congregations of the Puritans. Mm -hmm. And your description of that second temple reminds me of Boston from 1620 to 1670 when the controlling people that ran the city were the religious experts and the three forms of government, three branches of government, the judicial, the administrative, and, and the legislative. So it's exactly the same. They nice. controlled everything. And yeah. the breakthrough of Boston was when the thing that split apart. And, and ah, so, you, so Unitarians are crypto what? Let's say there's some similarities in the early start here. And maybe that's what we need to get a start. Maybe that's yeah, no, that's wonderful. We well, you know, uh, Laura has a colleague, Matt Kinane, historian, who has written. I'm getting off subject. I can't help it. Uh, he's written a book on a diary, 2,000-page diary, by a industrialist, a, mer a merchant, a cloth merchant, in the 1700s. 1730 to 1760 or 70, he kept this 2,000 page journal. He started off, well, he, his whole life, he attended congregational, that is to say, dissident, Puritan, Calvinist congregations. By the end of that diary, one of those congregations had become Unitarian, and one of the preachers was Joseph Priestley, who was one of the founders of the organization in the United States. So he stayed with those congregations. We lived through that transition in England, and he's a wonderful pickup to what you just said as a follow-up. Okay, so here's what I want to say. Real Israel is polytheistic from the start. Okay? It was a Society just like the surrounding ones. Let's go ahead. Down. I, I, I'm going to go through this rather rip rapidly. I've got you know evidence of <laughs> evidence of it, but I'm going to actually move through this quickly. It. Uh, let's go ahead. Um, here's some examples from the Old Testament. Just a few. In one of the Psalms, it says, "The other gods are called on to worship the Lord. Worship Him, all you gods." That doesn't sound monotheistic. <laughs> if there are other gods worshiping Yahweh, worshiping the Lord, then let's go ahead. Let's see. I'm not, I'm not making this up. <laughs> I will sing your praise before the gods. Uh, among the gods, there's none like you. Well, maybe whatever you want to do with this. But there it is. Um, and so on. Let's go ahead. Uh, and so on. Uh, now, some of you may, some of you, actually, let me ask you, how many of you are aware that in the first two chapters of Genesis, which are the story of creation, there are two very, very distinct versions?
versions of that creation story. Okay, some of you. And they are very different in many ways. The style, the whole thing, if you stop and somebody tells you that, you suddenly, like a Rorschach, you just suddenly see it. Well, the first chapter, yeah. That is one of the foundations of the Christian science religion, that fact. Is that right? I didn't know that. Okay. Um, the name of the deity in Hebrew is different in the two accounts. In the first account, the name of the deity is Elohim, which is a plural for the word El. And El is a well-known, again, on the basis of all of this material evidence, a deity of surrounding societies. Okay, there's no, there's no guesswork about this. Uh, and a, what, do you, what, what, what does it mean to have a plural name for God? Let us make man in our image. What if, well, the theologians have, you know, have trouble with that. And they love it. They've been they, they, debating it for 2,000 years. Go ahead. Top feminists. <laughs> oh, I'm getting to that. <laughs> okay, the second creation story in Hebrew, the name of the deity is Yahweh. Elohim. In other words, they've combined the two names. But Yahweh is, again, clearly the name of a separate deity. And what they've done is to combine them into a single one. Well, again, I could go on and on and on about other differences um, uh, between the two accounts, but there you have the polytheism right there embedded in the text. Two separate deity names. Go ahead. Uh, here's the feminist uh, <laughs> input. Um, did God have a wife? Yes. Um, her name was Asher. Actually, there were a number of names, but it as you can see, the name of this deity appears 40 times in the Hebrew Bible. Uh, keep going. Uh, there are shrines throughout the history of Israel. Now, can you guess what the Bible was saying, what the Old Testament was saying about those shrines? Bad, bad, bad. <laughs> <laughs> people are falling away up to the false deities. But it kept happening. And they kept reforming, and then the next thing you know, they're there. And my favorite example, Again, I'm getting a little off subject, but one of the cult objects of Asher was a serpent. <laughs> a snake. And in the Old Testament, there's a story about the children in the wilderness who had disobeyed and were told, Moses was told, construct a bronze serpent and hold it up, and all of the people who look at the bronze serpent will be healed. Blink. What's that all about? Okay, well, we can set that aside. But it turns out that 400 years later, in the Old Testament, it's still there in Jerusalem. And it wasn't destroyed until then by Josiah. And then, my favorite question to fundamentalists, who all know John 3.16 is, and if you've ever been to a football game, you see John 3.16 down at the back of the gold posts. Gold posts. Do they know John 3.14? And I haven't found one yet who does. And John 3.14 says, As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man in Christ be lifted up. So the serpent, as we know from Egyptian culture, was a positive healing symbol. And the serpent as a cult figure for Asherah is a positive figure. Let's keep going. What is John 14? Because I know that. John 14 is as Moses lifted up the serpent. I think she's asking about John, John, John 3, 16. John 16. Oh, for God so loved the world. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. I don't know that. Can you say that again? Sure. John 3, 16. Um, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever because fundamentalists are evangelizing. They want you to know that if you know you will that God so loves the world, he will save you if you fall. Sorry. Um, okay, let's keep going. Um, this is just more evidence. But let me stop on this last one, because actually there are three uh, cult objects associated with Asher. Not just a snake or a serpent, but a tree and a garden. Does that sound familiar? Yeah. <laughs> Tell me about it. Eden, the Garden of Eden, the four sons of female, 
and these other three are associated. What in the world is that about? <laughs> keep going. Um, keep going. Oh, okay, I'm gonna have to keep you in suspense for a minute. I'll come back to that. Um, so now, I'm gonna move from the polytheistic Israel to the myth of Israel. The mythic history that we have in the Bible is a myth of one God, one temple, one city, one people, one law, one book, one canon. Does that sound familiar? Mm -hmm. We carry right over into us, into Christianity. Keep going. And I'm going to call this, by the way, I'm going to use that word monomyth because it's not just monotheism, right? It's one everything else. There's a, uh, so I want to use that word just to represent this myth, the story. Yeah. So moving down to the singular God, temple, etc., from multi gods, mm -hmm. uh, it goes in the direction that the next step is not. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll go along with that. Or at least it confuses things. Let's go ahead. Um, now, who were the inventors of the Smith? I've said very little about Second Temple Judaism. But within that Second Temple society, there was a party of elite exiles. They had been court figures. They were priests who had been in Babylon for 70 years. In fact, this was a second generation. They, these, these folks who went back in uh, yeah, 70 years later uh, and began the process of creating, recreating themselves as a society uh, really were um, sent back by the Persian authorities. Now, here's where the history, I know I'm skipping a lot, and I'm, I'm going to have to just not answer questions about the history here, or we'll, we'll never get through anything. So if you can just hang on <laughs> uh, to the larger picture here, because what I'm now doing is getting into the six centuries of history that is being excavated and being presented. And it, it is where I want to direct your attention if you have any curiosity after that. And that's where I will have some recommendations. OK, but they were not the whole people. They were a party that came back with a specific agenda assigned to them by the imperial authorities. They were not independent. And they had been exposed to a scribal written tradition that went back 3,000 years, okay? They were not inventing or writing out of the blue in a vacuum. Keep going. If you've heard of the Gilgamesh epic, which is the most famous of the texts from the Mesopotamian traditions, this long epic that you can go down to the bookstore and find a lovely English translation of, there are copies of that that go back. They can actually follow the addition, the revision of that over like, 1,500 years. They don't have to guess how it was put together. Um, so I've already indicated how these myth makers, these scribes, could take sources that talked about multiple gods and turn them into a narrative of one god. And the, the, the fundamental strategy was to say, well, every time you see Asherah, Baal, whoever, it's the people who've gone away, or the priests have led them aside, or uh, the evil kings, the sinful kings have fallen away from God. So they have a nice spin, right? We know all about spin these days. Keep going. So uh, this is my, keep going. I'm coming back to Genesis 2, the Eden story. And I, again, uh, if this gets your curiosity, and I hope it does, I heard a talk two weeks ago by Art George, who's publishing a book coming out in May. That's the title of the book, It Always Divorce. And he's got an exquisite interpretation of Genesis 2. It's a story by the myth makers to do everything he can to separate Yahweh from the female deity. It's a scribal, exegetical, strategy for constructing a narrative out of materials that are problematic. Keep going. Here's one of his slides. Of course, this is medieval, okay? This is not historical evidence, but it shows that in the Middle Ages, Christians, somebody, had Adam and Eve. We know about the tree. We know about the serpent. But what's, what's she doing there? And horns on her head. Exactly. So this is where these figures merge into the story. Here's one more that he shows us. 
Go ahead. Interesting. Here's another one. And again, clearly probably, you know, Renaissance. Now, when I first saw this, I assumed that this was Eve. But no, no, there's Eve. Who's this? She's grown out of the tree, and there's the snake's tail. So this is clearly uh, an understanding that wasn't invented in the 20th, 21st century by Art George. Let's go ahead. So the purpose of the story, in its context, was to disassociate, to divorce Asherah from Noah. Keep going. Um, so how do we think about Israel? Recognize that it emerged out of intercourse with the surrounding peoples. Go ahead. One scholar has called this the common theology of the ancient Near East, and I'm going to say a bit more about that later on. Go ahead. Uh, recognize that the Old Testament story of the made manifest of Israel from all others is a myth. Now I'm using the word myth here as a fiction. Okay. I'm going to use it in a slightly different way in a minute. Keep going. Okay, now, the second invention is the reinvention of themselves as Judaism, out of which came modern rabbinic Judaism. Go ahead. And it was founded on this mythic tradition. Go ahead. So creating that myth of Israel was also creating their own founding myth. They were talking about themselves. Go ahead. In that sense, a myth is not just a fiction. It's also about me. Who am I? And uh, this definition of myth, an understanding of ourselves, who we are as a collective, <clears throat> is a definition used by a, an American political theorist. He's not a theologian. He's a political, secular, as far as I know, Sheldon Wolin, you may have heard of him. He uses that same understanding of myth as a collective story about a people, about themselves, to talk about American history, how we understand ourselves as Americans. We think maybe that we've got the historical version of that, but most of us have some sort of mythic <coughs> part. So that's a second way of using the word myth. It's not just a fiction. It's also, or at least it's a fiction about ourselves, and we don't think it's a fiction. It's not just a fiction. It's creative. Go ahead. So, uh, keep going. First rule, use the word myth in these two, two definitions. Go ahead. Go ahead. Again, I'm just, this is just a summary of what I said. And this is almost a quote from Sheldon Wolin's definition. Uh, you asked me about the temple. The temple was the primary symbol of that monomyth. Uh, it was the central symbol of God, go ahead. The symbol, central symbol of this larger myth, go ahead. And when they came back from Babylon, their first job was to, they saw it as building, rebuilding the temple. The temple in those days, by the way, was the treasure. The treasure. So the Persians wanted them to rebuild the temple so they could start collecting taxes. As well as to actually start legislating. And controlling the people. The English Empire was ruled by what they called indirect rule. They would appoint uh, local leaders to keep, to keep order. And that's exactly what Persia did. So they wanted the Persian, the, the Jewish authorities and so on, to keep order and to collect taxes. Let's go ahead. By the first century AD, now we are jumping six centuries. From 586, 6th century, in Greek terms, just to go back to your question, sort of how does this relate to what's going on around it? Six, 500s was, um, 400s was great century of, um, <coughs> of uh, Greek flourish, flourishing. So Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, all 400s into the 300s. Okay, so we're, we're in that time when the Greek culture is beginning to, uh, to flourish in its form uh, uh, in that sense. And now we're moving to the first century. So we're skipping, not skipping, but moving from uh, to, to what Judaism looked like in the first century. Here's what the temple looked like by then. This is a National Geographic uh, marvelous uh, story about the constructions by Herod in Palestine 
<coughs> and some of them were some of the largest in the Roman world. And the temple of Jerusalem, I have seen, I haven't been able to <laughs> confirm it, was one of the largest temples known. I mean, it really was considered one of the one of the sites. But you're saying it wasn't a place of worship. Oh yes, it was a place of oh, worship. But you said I'm sorry, it was both. Okay. Oh, okay. But it was both. I mean, remember Jesus. Well, you maybe yes. don't remember. Right? <laughs> one of the stories of Jesus was to ch chase out the money changers ah, okay. in, the right, in the temple. Well, right. the money changers have been there for 500 years. That wasn't something new. Keep going. Uh, so now let's move to the third invention. How to think about the origins of Christianity. And obviously I'm opening up a can of worms. <laughs> so I'm going to move quickly again. <laughs> no, no, I want to open it up. But I want to get to the... I want to get to the worms. <laughs> uh, before it was a Christianity, it was what one scholar calls, I love it, a Jesus dialect of first century Judaism. Why do I like that? Because the one distinguishing thing about the literature that is Christian is the name Jesus. Not much else keeps them together. They have wildly different views of who this name represented. But that was the one thing you can say, well, they were Christian, those were Jews. The rest of it becomes very blurred. Keep going. So the first rule is discard outworn pictures of first century Judaism that I've touched on. It was dead, uninventive, legalistic, and so on. Keep going. This is a verse from the book of Acts, the fifth book in the New Testament. Pentecost. Now there were devout men staying in Jerusalem from every nation under heaven. A bit of an exaggeration, but keep going. <laughs> now, I expect all of you to recognize every single name. Parthians, <laughs> Medes, Elamites, etc., 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 etc. Go ahead. I've mapped it out for you. Go ahead. There we go. Here's Jerusalem. And these arrows are pointing to the names of the peoples. In Jerusalem, in the first century, a few years after Christ died, according to the New Testament narrative. And by the way, I want you to notice something. What's on the left? What's this? It's the, Mes Mes it's the Mediterranean world, right? Yes. It's the Roman Empire. But notice that the Jews came from outside the Roman Empire all the way over to the east. I had to put two maps together to get this. Because I could not find a single map of the first century Christian world that extended all the way far enough to the east. The Medes, this is, this is modern Iran. Um, yep, and uh, this was for the sake of my one of my friends um, who was interested in, in, the, uh, in the Silk Road. The Silk Road was opened up during this period. It was trade. Uh, so this is a big world. And Jews were still in Babylon during this time, as well as all the way over into the eastern, western Mediterranean. So, first century Judaism, Judaism lived in an expanded world. A little bit like ours. The world got gotten much bigger. Uh, keep going. It not only expanded geographically, it expanded vertically. <laughs> Okay, from the this is the this is the picture of the cosmos in Genesis one. It's three stories. You've got waters above, waters below, and here's the earth. That's it. It's a pretty small world. It's a little mound on water, and it's surrounded by water. And floods were pretty common. And it was a picture of the world in Egypt and in Mesopotamia. Well, by the first century, we're living in something that was much closer to Ptolemy's. Well, then we think of that as, oh, Earth-centered. How outdated. Well, for them, that was huge. And you have no idea how fascinated they had become in the first century by how far up did it go? Paul went up to the third heaven, according to his own account in 2 Corinthians. But there were some who said, no, there were seven heavens. Nope, there were eight heavens. Nope, there were more than that. And uh, it got very big. Keep going. Uh, so what happens to God? You, you said it yourself there. You know, he gets farther and farther away until he disappears. You know, there are such things as dead gods. Gods who just die out of existence. Who, 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 
no, we won't. We, we've gotten too far away to be to be contacted. Keep going. So what happens when that happens? When the high guy gets too high? Well, what happened during this period was what I call a population explosion in Kentucky. Between the top and the bottom, you have an incredible, incredible, unending, exhausting uh, list of names. They were basically collecting names of gods from everybody they had learned them from, the Egyptians, the Mesopotamians. They were all coming together, just like today. It's a, it's a huge, marvelous explosion of imagination, actually. Keep going. <clears throat> and not only that, but the traffic between up and down was getting congested. <laughs> That's a bit of an exaggeration, but I've read one account that said demons in this first century were regarded the way we regard microbes. <laughs> they were omnipresent. They explained lots of things. They weren't necessarily bad. They just were there. <laughs> okay, so their world of heaven and earth, man and God, is nothing like ours. And it can't be just, you know, reduced to a few little formulas, polytheism, monotheism. So, uh, this is one of the, my favorite titles. The Dictionary of Deities and Demons in the Bible. There are over 500 entries. So this is not just outside the Bible. Keep going. Okay, now, how to think about Christian origins. The second rule is, or my wife prefers the word suggestion, uh, recognize <laughs> anachronisms like monotheism. Okay, what's an anachronism? Well, it covers over the past with layers of ideas that we bring to it from the present. The word monotheism we use today is one of these words that covers things over. Keep going. We use it today to mean there is only one God who exists. There's no other existing thing or person or whatever. Keep going. Ancient monotheism doesn't mean that. It means there's one God on top. And it's better called monolatry, which is another mouthful. But it basically means only one God deserves worship. Um, and this movement, this party of exiles who came back are one example of a party that was not monotheistic in our sense, but said, you owe allegiance to one deity only. Keep going. Here's, I love this. Uh, the common theology of the ancient Near East, let's just keep going through this, okay? Prayer and praise are usually directed to one God at a time, who's flattered, exalted, we say. A chain of exaggeration is often found that goes from greatest, he's the greatest, there's no one like him. In fact, there isn't any other around. Well, the lines get blurred. Keep going. Even minor deities are regularly praised as keep going, greater than all other gods, often said to have created the world. They're the only true God sometimes, even when worshiped in close connection with other deities. Mm -hmm. Now, I get this from an item that I put in the bibliography. It's something that probably nobody's going to want to look up, but it's, it's a wonderful little article that has example after example after example after. I mean, it's just heavy with examples from that body of material evidence that I was talking about. Keep going. Keep going. So, um, a third rule. Recognize that there wasn't just one Judaism. Keep going. Uh, and that the heavenly hierarchy of God is not the same for all of the Jewish population. Keep going. Uh, my favorite of all writers has compared <coughs> Second Temple Judaism to the Cambrian explosion in uh, organic life. <laughs> okay, what happened? It exploded with multicellular life. It exploded with new species. It was animated. It was inventive. Keep going. It was different, diverse. Keep going. It was alive. Keep going. And again, I don't, you don't have to write that down. I will have that source. But David Atkinson is the basic spirit behind this whole talk. Keep going. Uh, the other one strong recommendation I make is this guy, this, this book. Uh, go ahead and hit the, uh, let's just keep going. Now, what I want to say about, and the only thing I want to say about this book, the title of it is In Search of First Century Christianity. By, by the way, two authors who were used terrorists. 
Gerald Barnhart taught the philosophy of religion and writes about um, Dostoevsky in literature. And he teamed up with Linda Crager, who's also a professor of literature. Was she was she was she was she was, she was killed in a in a uh, uh, in a church in a Unitarian church. In, it was in Texas. Mm -hmm. uh, some mad gunman walked in and started firing. Mm -hmm. So they're interesting in their own right. But their book is a model of the suggestions I'm making for how to understand first century Christianity. Uh, they discarded <coughs> outworn ideas. Go ahead. They basically, this is a summary of the rules of the suggestions that I've made. Go ahead. Uh, but they go a step further. Keep going. And uh, this is the one that I hope blows your mind. Uh, don't assume that Christianity had to have a single figure who was the founder. Well, that's the assumption that's driven biblical scholarship, New Testament scholarship, for 2,000 years. Keep going. Uh, this is a quote from their book. The various streams that flowed into the river that we call early Christianity were too numerous and deep for the movement to have had a single founder. Go ahead. Jesus or Paul could not have on their own been founders. Go ahead. This is now the title, Chaos Theory of Christian Origins. That's my term. But I think it fits their theory of Christian origins. Christianity emerged out of the convergence of many forces, and again, just go from political, cultural, religious, and theological, or I would prefer mythical, psychosocial, and imagination of new expectations, something new. Something very human about it. Go ahead. So, the, 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 the final rule is, mind the evidence we have. What we have in the New Testament is nothing but evidence of the communities. Okay? The poor questers for Jesus have got to go through all that and throw it away to get to Jesus. What, they're, what are they doing? They're peeling the onion. There's nothing down there, or very little. And even one of the most uh, leading representatives of the latest quest has said that the whole thing is an embarrassment. And he's still doing it. But they're throwing away the good stuff. They're throwing away the evidence of these communities who were struggling. Go ahead through this. We've run out of time. Um, and I don't have time to, to explain all this. But I'm basically saying the same thing. I would like to shift. I'm suggesting that we shift the focus in Christ New Testament studies from the quest for historical Jesus to this human effort by these communities to think about their own self-understanding. Who are they? That's what we've got. And that's what they represent in that book. Go ahead. I can stop there. This is a summary. Keep going. I've got one more slide I'd like to throw out for you. Go ahead. So what I've given you here is a sketch. I'm going to call it a model. I've been reading economics. Uh, a heuristic. That is to say, it's a tool like a map or something to help us see things. Uh, they work by simplifying, leaving things out. I certainly left a lot out and made some mistakes. But models like that that simplify can be either gifts or they can be poison, depending on how we use them and depending on whether we forget that we're dealing with model. Monotheism is just one more model of concentrated focus, and there has been good coming out of that, and as we know, there's been some pretty uh, hard coming out of it. So that's what it is. It was a creation of human imagination, trying to understand themselves. One of the fruits, heart fruits, of monotheism, along with Greek speculation about one force, is science. And the abilities of science to look for the gut. The grand unified theory of <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm going to stop. <laughs>
i as i said, i grew up in ah in ah in a fundamentalist missionary home in africa. when i was a senior in high school, i started witnessing to a girl in front of me in an english class and she started talking back and that's the first time i remember not taking it all for granted and wondering okay and then i'm realizing i don't know anything about this. you know i'm supposed to have known what the bible was and i realized i didn't so i wound up going to a bible college instead of to university of north carolina and that went on from there until um for the next twelve years i was trying to believe and then it fell apart and the greatest experience of my life was three years in germany when the flood just picked me up and carried me right out and i wound up at the university of chicago and got a phd in biblical scholarship i wrote a dissertation on the new testament on the new testament on the gospel of john under a jewish my professor my advisor he was he was my salvation first lecture i heard there was his first lecture and he's one of my as my kids know he's one of my heroes i mean he's really somebody that i still because i found out the week after the 2004 elections i picked up his latest volume of essays and the first one was sort of we call a bio bibliographical essay and it ends with this sentence religion is the relentlessly human activity of thinking through a situation. Of thinking, of thinking, thinking through a situation. Religion is thinking. Well, in 2004, the week after the elections, that hit me like a ton of bricks because we just elected somebody who was <laughs> guiding policy by faith. What he meant by faith, right? Bush. And I thought, that's why I've been reading this guy all, ever since, because he's, his way of thinking about religion is to see what we can learn about how to think. I mean, really, he is, he's, a, uh, he's not. So his, so his definition of religion was antithetical to how religion was being used. Precisely. And uh, every article he's ever written, he's, 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 he's as much an anthropologist of religion He's not a theologian. He's he's very he's he's. I'll say one more thing about him. For 40 years, he's he's a full professor. He can teach anything he wants at the University of Chicago. He's got a position of chair. He has spent the last 40 years teaching undergraduates. In fact, he created he stayed there because they gave him they allowed him to create a program in. Religion and the humanities. He was going to leave because they were going to drop that. And I heard him speak in February last year, and he said, um, you know, that his primary mission is introductory classes because he sees religion as a human construct for how to understand the human condition, along with science and others. And he introduces religion as a mission of the liberal academy. He's written more about liberal education as much, that's not true, he's been writing about liberal education all through his career as well as religion. And he's one of the few people I know of actually trying to write an article to say he's somebody that the public conversation could learn from about how to think about religion in the public sphere. Uh, what was his name? His name is Jonathan Smith. I didn't put him on the bibliography. <laughs> Um, but I can, I can, I can indicate it. Uh, he's he's a, he's a scholar, scholar, except that he's, you know, he's been teaching undergraduates for 40 years. So I so think. Where, where are you? At? Are you a faculty person? I don't know. I'm not. I, I I've done some teaching off and on, but wound up 25 years to, uh, in the computer business. <laughs> I retired uh, three or two and a half years ago. and came back to. And do, to this, this, uh, these intellectual pursuits. I don't go to church, uh, as I think I mentioned, but I, I have never been able to shake, shake it all off. And about uh, 1992 or three, I finally said to myself, "Yeah, go ahead, finish." Um, that um, you know, <coughs> I'm not going to let them, meaning the fundamentalists, keep me from the Bible anymore. I've got too much of my life invested in it. I'm going to go back and see if I can sort out what I still have that's part of me from the stuff that is no longer part of me. And that's one of the uh, sources of this. Try, there's something there that's part of all of us. You know, uh, Laura told me that she had, uh, uh, that they, uh, that, um, 
Well, Barton Williams, they are trying to encourage students to major in history. And so, major in history, so they're giving a series of lectures on history matters. That's the title. Well, I, the, 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 the fundamental premise behind this talk is history matters. And we, and the, the, this biblical history, this religious history, is too important to the rest of us to leave to them. We need to claim it. We need to take it over and look at it in the contexts that are part of our heritage and adopt it. Right. And I think that Unitarians ought to, too. <laughs> so when Bob and I got involved in this back in July, August, one of the questions that started coming up when this group started was, we really, we want to think about why we come to church okay. as, as non-Trinitarians. And I think your uh, definition from your mentor there that John Lee Smith, yeah, yeah, process of thinking is, is one of the answers that comes back in. We may want to explore that in this group. Well, I'll definitely get a copy of that to, to folks. And, and the second thing is, in this model you've got here that says there was a multi-century time of ferment and, and finally out the end came the real truth should be familiar to Unitarians because we all know the Nicene Council in the fourth century was the pair, was the poem I always pictured as a big, big democratic convention <laughs> when the outcome was is it, are we Trinitarian or Unitarian? And if you look at the Nag Hammadi uh, Gospels that were found, you can find a lot of Gospels that were thrown out in that process to get to the real truth of Trinitarian. So your model, I think, is the bigger version of what Unitarians usually hold up as. as I'd like to talk more about that. But, but I think you're assuming a lot. Um, I think a lot of us come here who don't have that kind of background. Sure. Mm -hmm. and, and That's not the only reason. I was at, a, at, at another conference, and I, I learned that the person who was giving the presentation uh, described herself as being a non-Christian Unitarian. I said, gee, you know, I mean, I, I've been here for years. I've never heard anybody say that. <clears throat> so that's probably one of the persons one of the people who has rejected this and gone the Simon's way. But even if that's the case, and even if you consider yourself an intellectual and, and modern and all of those things, you know, social culture, uh, you should know this. And I found this incredibly interesting for me because it's still a part, it still should be a part of my history. In some way, yeah. I should know it. Yeah, I, I think that's true. And the, and the problem is figuring out how to put it into a place that helps. Can't hear you. I'm going to try to remember a quote from Roland Barthes about the myth. He says something that myth is a, a technique that humans use to explain the world when they don't know. Mm -hmm. The myth has been, and so it's, he wants to undermine that process a little bit, but he also recognizes that it's always there and it's never going to go away. Yeah. And I hear, like, I hear a lot of myth making, let's say, in the power of science. Yeah, yeah, good. Like, I Absolutely. find science to be incredibly <laughs> mythological. It's been mythologized in our world today. Absolutely. Not to say it's not important or, or not incorrect even, that what it does, but the myth of science I find to be incredibly powerful. Yeah. And so for me, this idea of thinking, thinking religiously yeah. is an antidote, yeah. a strange antidote <laughs> to, uh, to science, because that would suggest to me that there are multiple truths. What multiple ways of knowing the world. Yeah. Um, and so I'm very interested in this, on the one hand, debunking myth, certain myths, <laughs> but it always takes a myth to debunk a myth. So we're always in that world of I myth. think it's a great conversation. So I, I, I'm, I'm I think curious, that, like, what your, your, your I, well, position look, on, on the mythology. I, 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 I'm, I'm convinced that we need to stop being so shy of the word myth that we need to start coming to terms with it in those two senses. Um, my other talk, from here, it isn't really talk, economic fundamentalism. Uh, and, and I gave, actually, anyway, that's, that's the other soapbox. It's, it's, it's another version of secular myth, right? Secular belief. I think, I, think, I wonder if it's just in the interest of giving people a, an opportunity to, to leave. Yeah, yeah, I want to thank that again for 